how beautiful, how beautiful the sense of all this. The painter looks at the scenery as if wanting to place it on a canvas. The musician gazes upon the ground. The actor thinks of himself in a really nice naturalistic scene, then strides across the space, sweeping in a half circle, looking at the panorama. Tell us, is it true that before you can act a part properly, you must feel the emotions of the character you are representing? Oh, well, yes and no. It depends what you mean. We have first to be able to feel and sympathize and also criticize the emotions and a character. We look at it from a distance before we close with it. We father as much as we can from the text and we call to mind all the emotions suitable for this character to exhibit. After having many times rearranged and selected these emotions which we consider of importance, we then practice to reproduce them before the audience and in order to do so we must feel as little as is necessary. In fact, the less we feel, the firmer will our hold be upon our facial and bodily expression. The musician sinks down into his chair. The painter rises to his feet and waves his hand impatiently, pacing. But has there never been an actor who has so trained his body from head to foot that it would answer to the working of his mind without permitting the emotions even so much as to awaken? Surely there must have been one actor, say one out of ten million, who has done this? No. Never, never. There never has been an actor who reached such a state of mechanical perfection that his body was absolutely the slave of his mind. Edmund Keane of England, Salvini of Italy, Rachel, Eleonora Booth. I call them all to mind, and I repeat, there never was an actor or actress such as you describe. Then you admit it would be a state of perfection. Why, of course, but it is impossible. Will always be impossible. The actor rises with a sense of relief. That is as much to say there never was a perfect actor. There has never been an actor who has not spoiled his performance once, twice, ten times, sometimes a hundred times during the evening. There never has been a piece of acting which could be called even almost perfect, and there never will be. But has there ever been a painting, or a piece of architecture, or a piece of music which may be called perfect? the musician and the artist. Undoubtedly, the laws which control our art make such a thing possible. A picture, for instance, may consist of four lines, or four hundred lines, placed in certain positions. It may be as simple as possible, but it is possible to make it perfect. That is to say, I can first choose that which is to make the lines. I can choose that on which I am to place the lines. I can consider this as long as I like. I can alter it, then in a state which is free from excitement, haste, trouble, nervousness, in fact, in it. Then in any state I choose, and of course I prepare, wait, and select that also. I can put these lines together, so now they are in their place. Having my material nothing except my own will can move or alter these, and as I have said, my own will is entirely under my control. The line can be straight or it can wave. It can be round if I choose, and there is no fear that when I wish to make a straight line, I shall make a curved one, or that when I wish to make a curved one, there will be square bit parts about it. And when it is ready, finished, it undergoes no change but that which time, who finally destroys it, wills. That is rather an extraordinary thing. I wish it was possible in my work. Yes, it is a very extraordinary thing, and that is which I hold makes the difference between an intelligent statement and a casual or haphazard statement. The most intelligent statement, that is a work of art. The haphazard statement, that is a work of chance. When the intelligent statement reaches its highest possible form, it becomes a work of fine art. And therefore, I have always held, though I may be mistaken, that our work has not the nature of an art. That is to say, and you have said it yourself, each statement that you make in your work is subject to every conceivable change which emotion chooses to bring about. That which you conceive in your mind, your body is not permitted by nature to complete. In fact, your body, gaining the better of your intelligence, has in many instances on the stage driven up the intelligence altogether. Some actors seem to say, what value lies in having beautiful ideas? To what end shall my mind conceive a fine idea? A fine thought for my body, which is so entirely beyond my control to spoil. I will throw my mind overboard. Let my body pull me and the play through. 
and there seems to me to be some wisdom in the standpoint of such an actor. He does not dilly-dally between the two things which are contending in him, the one against the other. He is not a bit afraid of the result. He goes at it like a man, sometimes a trifle too like a centaur. He flings away all science, all caution, all reason and the resulting good spirits in the audience. And for that they pay willingly. But we are here talking about other things than excellent spirits. And though we applaud the actor who exhibits such a personality as this, I feel that we must not forget that we are applauding his personality. He it is we applaud, not what he is doing or how he is doing it. Nothing to do with art at all. Absolutely nothing to do with art, with calculation or design. You're a nice, friendly creature telling me my art's no art. But I believe I see what you mean. You mean to say that before I appear on the stage and before my body commences to come into the question, I am an artist. Well, yes, you are. You happen to be. Because you are a very bad actor. You're abominable on the stage. But you have ideas. You have imagination. You are rather an exception, I should say. I have heard you tell me how you would play Richard III, what you would do, what strange atmosphere you would spread over the whole thing, and that which you have told me you have seen in the play, and that which you invented and added to it, is so remarkable, so consecutive in its thought, so distinct and clear in form, that if you could make your body into a machine or into a dead piece of material such as clay, and if it could obey you in every movement of the entire space of time it was before the audience and if you could put aside Shakespeare's poem you would be able to make a work of art out of that which is in you for you would not only have dreamt you would have executed to perfection and that which you had executed could be repeated time after time without so much difference as between two farthings ah you place a terrible picture before me you would prove to me that it is impossible for us ever to think of ourselves as artists. You take away our finest dream, and you give us nothing in its place. No, no, that's not for me to give you. That's for you to find. Surely there must be laws at the roots of the art of the theater, just as there are laws at the roots of all true art, which, if found and mastered, would bring you all desire. Yes, the search would bring the actors to a wall. Leap it, then. Too high. Scale it, then. How do we know where it will lead? Why, up and over. Yes, but that's talking wildly, talking the air. Well, that's the direction you fellows have to go. Fly in the air. Live in the air. Something will follow when some of you begin to, I suppose. You will get at the root of the matter in time, and then what a splendid future opens before you. In fact, I envy you. I am not sure I do not wish that photography has been discovered before painting, so that we of this generation might have had the intense joy of advancing, feeling that photography was pretty good in its way, but there was something better. Do you hold that our work is on the level with photography? No, indeed, it is not half as exact. It is less of an art even than photography. In fact, you and I who have been talking all this time, while the musician has sat silent, sinking deeper and deeper into his chair, our art by the side of his art are jokes, games, absurdities. The musician gets up and mutters about some foolish remark. But I don't see that that's such a wonderful remark for a representative of the only art in the world to make. My dear fellow, that is just because he is a musician. He is nothing except in his music. He is, in fact, somewhat unintelligent, except when he speaks in notes, in tones, and in the rest of it. He hardly knows our language. He hardly knows our world. And the greater the musician, the more is this noticeable. Indeed, it is rather a bad sign when you meet a composer who is intelligent. And as for the intellectual musician, why, that means another. But we mustn't whisper that name here. He is so popular today. What an actor this man would have been, and what a personality he had. I understand that all his life he had yearnings toward being an actor, and I believe he would have been an excellent comedian, whereas he became a musician. Or was it a playwright? Anyhow, it all turned out a great success. A success of personality. Was it not a success of art? Well, which art do you mean? Oh, all the arts combined. 
How can that be? How can all arts combine and make one art? It can only make one joke, one theater. Things which slowly, by a natural law joined together, may have some right in the course of many years or many centuries to ask nature to bestow a new name on their product. Only by this means can a new art be born. I do not believe that the old mother approves of the forcing process, and if she ever winks at it, she soon has her revenge. And so it is with the arts. You cannot commingle them and cry out that you have created a new art if you can find in nature new material, one which has never yet been used by a man to give forms to his thought. Then you can say that you are on the high road towards creating a new art. For you have found that by which you can create it. It then only remains for you to begin. The theater, as I see it, has yet to find that material.